You have this curious phenomenon of, it's what statisticians would call a bimodal relationship. Yeah. You have a condition, mm -hmm. dyslexia, which in the main proves highly disadvantageous mm -hmm. to the point where, as you point out, prisons are full of dyslexics. Mm -hmm. Then you have the separate phenomenon, which is if you systematically go through the upper levels of any profession, particularly entrepreneurs, you will find a hugely disproportionate number of dyslexics. Yes. The, one of the studies was 30% of successful entrepreneurs have some kind of related learning disability. Yes. So the question is, what's causing this? We understand the downside, the disadvantageous half, but there's this really puzzling and fascinating phenomenon of a separate smaller group who, if you ask them with dyslexia, who, if you ask them, will to a man say, I am where I am because of my dyslexia. I didn't overcome it. I, it forced me to learn things that made me into the entrepreneur that I am today or the trial lawyer that I am today. And also to a man or woman, they say that they would not wish it on their own child. No, it's because it's an incredibly painful yeah. process of learning. Even, even today, when it is far more early, early recognized and mm -hmm. it's far less of a stigma than it was when they had it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, this is pleading special interest, I suppose it, the same might be said of bipolarity. Um, and if you read K. Redfield Jameson and others, and, and um, um, you're aware of plenty of people in, uh, high up in, in uh, high functioning bipolar people who, who, mm -hmm. would, who would say that their bipolarity gives them an adventurousness. Um, uh, yeah. In terms of in, in the mania side of it, it gives them a, um, you know, that sort of entrepreneurial spirit and drive and um, daring quality, which can be overdone, of course. Yeah, as we but know. at a cost. Yeah, it can be at a very high cost. And yeah. they, again, wouldn't wish it on their children, but if you, if you ask them to press a button, to take it away from themselves, they would say, no, I'll keep it. It's yeah. part of who I am. Well, this is this, you know, it's this, it's this exceedingly interesting and complicated issue, which is, and it's where I sort of end up. I don't really um, claim that I can resolve it, but you understand that as human beings, we require um, people to have suffered certain kinds of adversity because we need the fruits of their of their learning, yes. you know, that if you, once you understand that there are certain kinds of things as human beings, we only try because we are faced with some kind of obstacle or we have suffered yes. in some way or we have, and those, thi those things that arise out of those situations are crucial for the betterment of humanity. Yes. Then you, you're in this odd situation of saying, oh, then I, is that, d does that mean that I should be in favor of people having disabilities or suffering or being or even being or? ornery i mean you you yeah. make the you, you quote the the great uh, line of george bernard shaw's is that uh, the, the the reasonable man adapts himself to the world the unreasonable man uh, persists in trying to adapt the world to himself mm -hmm. therefore all progress is due to unreasonable men yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's yeah. a very a very beguiling argument um, yeah, that, yeah. That, that there are ordinary cusses out there, and then you could t t cite people like Steve Jobs, for example. Who oh, are one of the most disagreeable. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and God bless him for it. Yeah, I mean, it's totally. this kind of, um, I, I, you know, I was very. That's some of my part of my favorite part of the book because um, it's given me a new appreciation for, um, or it has made me realize that. Perhaps we overvalue certain kinds of sociable traits. Yes. Um, and they too have a cost. It's very nice to hang around with someone who is charming and friendly and um, mm. sweet and gracious. But to understand that, you know, we're not going to advance as a world on sweetness no. and graciousness. Um, I ought to move on to questions specifically from Guardian readers, as the Guardian is kind enough to, to host this. So someone called R. Brightwings, which is a rather nice moniker, says, I'm consistently dazzled by Gladwell's ability to begin with two seemingly totally different propositions, fields, observations, and then seamlessly rope them together. I remember one essay in The New Yorker that began with a discussion of football and segued into some brilliant observation about a totally different field. Sorry, I didn't have it handy to be more accurate. I'd love to know more, more about how this process works. Mm -hmm. Do you keep a journal and jot down observations about the world and then see a link, seek out patterns? Or as in Blink, do you have an aha moment? Well, I suppose I, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer to that question. I, I mean, I'm very fond of that kind of, um, I mean, I'll give you the kind of, uh, I'll give you kind of the kind of budget Freudian response, which is yeah. that my mother is a uh, social worker and psychologist who is Jamaican. My yeah. father is a good Kentish 
mathematician. Right. Now, I think that if you grow up in a household where your parents occupy, um, y name the continuum, <laughs> they are on either ends of it. Yes, right? two, two different magisteria, as <laughs> Stephen yes. Jay Gould would say. That's right. <laughs> so I, th I sort of think I, what you do if you have parents who appear to be so different is that you, you, you look for uncommon commonalities, right? Yeah. That's sort of what you're, um, yes. what yes. you're hard, you're, you're socialized to do. That's so maybe that's maybe that's sort of where it starts. I is. like that. That's very. And they good did too. that, of course. I mean, that was the genius. That, that is the genius of their marriage. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's the same with my parents. My father's a physicist. My mother, uh, history. Uh, Stuart Johnson. This is an interesting question. Um, after all, you've learned from writing your books. What, if any, changes have you made to how you live your life yourself? Oh, that's interesting. Um, a little bit. I mean, blink disabused me of any belief in my own judgments. Yeah. I became paralyzed uh, in a good way after writing that book because I just became aware of all of the opportunities for yeah. uh, bias to creep into my yes. assessments. And I was, became particularly concerned with the way that I judged people. Um, I realized that the best thing you can do with people is not is to defer your judgments of them yes. until you uh, have seen them in many different contexts and know them a good deal better. So I, tr I very, to the extent that one can do this, I embarked on a mission that I'm still on to try and never reach a conclusion about someone until I have sort of met them, you know, X yeah. number of times. And someone tells me here, this is um, Iceni Queen. I don't know if she's an East Anglian like me, but Iceni Queen implies Boudicca. How do you acquire the job title Thinker, which is apparently your job title? I, it wasn't offered to me by school careers officers. <laughs> Am I think I think it's very generous reading of, 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 of what I do. Uh, I, well, I'm a journalist, so I suppose mm. you get, by virtue of being a journalist, you're allowed to roam around and um, mm. think about things. Um, but I wouldn't call myself a... I don't consider myself an intellectual. No. Um, I think that's a very specific and rarefied title for someone who makes significant contributions. I'm more of a kind of a, I round up interesting things and yeah. put them together. And you are you are a populist, and, and for some people, uh, to, to a sort of Susan Sontag, just, just not, no disrespect to her, but that sort of um, scale of intellectual, self-conscious intellectual, that might be considered a, mm. uh, um, a bad word. But to me, it's a very popular word. I mean, my heroes are Richard Feynman and people like that, and Carl Sagan, people who popularized it without embarrassment and were themselves obviously mm -hmm. extremely able and capable. Finally, I, what I wanted to say well, it was two things. One is. I, you could almost sum up a lot of the book in the six words of Shakespeare and as you like it, sweet are the uses of adversity. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is what could, let's say somebody who has dys <laughs> dyslexia and is struggling through your book, which they mm -hmm. naturally would do, uh, or who comes from a very poor home uh, um, and is, in a, a, you know, is the wrong side of the, the inverted U, mm -hmm. um, has many of the disadvantages, like the, the guy who grew up in um, Wisconsin, was it, and swept drives and then became an incredibly powerful mm -hmm. Hollywood mogul. Um, all these, uh, what can they take away from it, as it were, and al allow themselves to be like the guy who ends up as being head of Goldman's, Goldman Sachs, which these days is not that much of a compliment, but you know, it's certainly an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think what I'm trying to say with the book is that there is no, I mean, the, 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 I began with the story of David and Goliath, yeah. and then I told the story about the Indian guy who coached his daughter's basketball yeah. team, because they're both examples of people without obvious advantages who, uh, who uh, refuse to be passive, yeah. who refuse to take that, the conventional notion of themselves as underdogs, as a reason to roll over and play dead. Yeah. Um, and it's that, that's the kind of spirit, that's the intended to be the kind of message of the book, which is just because you, you lack yeah. all the things that we conventionally believe are necessary for success, doesn't mean you can't be successful. And I uh, uh, omitted to mention the other wonderful principle, and that is that of the remote miss, which you, you use the Blitz as an example, where everyone had imagined that if bombs were falling and raining down on London, within a very few weeks, London would be utterly demoralized. In yeah. fact, the reverse happened. It was a city of so many millions, 
that the chances were you'd hear a bomb going off near you and think, phew, that wasn't me. And rather than being depressed about it, you actually were quite cheerful. Exhilarated. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. By the, there's this hilarious thing. By the end, by the end of the Blitz, the, all these psychiatrists who had been, you know, uh, who had been hired by the, by, by the government to kind of scrutinize the morale of Londoners, watch in astonishment as Londoners begin to go about their business. Yeah as the bombs fall and the air raid sirens go off. I mean, it's this kind of interesting thing about how quickly people understand what, yes. um, or adjust their psychology to the yeah. situations in front of them. And, and it would be quite wrong to, 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 to uh, basically think that's a result of the British uh, stiff upper lip, because that's also true of the citizens of Berlin and... and, yeah. and, and yeah. Although I have to say, yes, it, is a, it seems to be a human universal. Although, mm. you know, it's, it would be interesting to, it's probably a mistake to, completely rule out national characteristics. <laughs> yes. That there is a thing where um, countries have mythologies about themselves which feed into these more basic psychological processes. So if you go to Israel, there is a, a national mythology about their yes. toughness and resilience which um, accentuates their yes. um, human, um, basic human resilience yes. that kind of makes them even more kind of so you do get these kinds of, the, yeah. the, you know, these things feed on themselves. Yes, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy about yeah. yourself, yeah. And, and I suppose the ideal thing would be for you in a few years for someone to come up and say, I had a place at Cornell, uh, but I decided to take um, X University, uh, where I shone and excelled in a way that I know I never would have done at Cornell, and I have you to thank for that. Yes, that, I so, hope so, that And similar stories. So, I mean, it, because you don't, you don't give advice, you don't say, it, 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 as I have to emphasize, because it's a genre I really dislike, it's not a how-to book at yeah. all, is it? Yeah. You don't tell people what to do, but you do show mm -hmm. you know, phases of human behavior and fields of human yeah. behavior and so on, out of which one can learn. Um, it's really it, the opposite of a how-to book, isn't it? It's like yes. A, it's a, it, it, a lot of these things complicate our yeah. understanding. They don't simplify our understanding. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, I don't know what the uh, how not to or how. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as, um, as a six foot uh, five giant and talking to a slim and a very fast runner, I know you were very good at uh, <laughs> uh, athletics at school. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you, pleasure. Thank young you so Master much. David. <laughs> and this is Goliath Thank signing you, Goliath. off. Yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.